starting when? Now? Yeah, it's good for you. Good for me. Good I'm good. For we good? Sure. Okay. Here we are. Let's see. Welcome, everybody, to a local production of, uh, well, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's called The Dirty War. The um, Dirty War. The Dirty War, because basically... Guerra Sucia. Yeah, we we have we have uh, right now. Uh, it did last week at Sundance they had a, a documentary film screening, and one of the uh, award winners uh, is Jeremy Scahill and another guy um, with a, a documentary called The Dirty War, and basically what it's about is Afghanistan and uh, the atrocities. Mac, that's enough, and uh, the atrocities. You know, they happen all during war, and especially during wars where there's no reporters, Andy. None. You know, it's just None in the field. Yeah, there's no reporters or anything. So what these guys did, the, Jeremy Scahill and, and the other guy, they, they um, got first-hand accounts. They went to the village, and they talked to the, uh, they talked to the people. And what happens was one of the atrocities happened at a village called Gardiz. And basically, they talk about when they went in, these people were partying because they were Dari. They're not Pashtuns. Um, and they had the women were uncovered, and the, uh, in the, in the, the, they had music. And so having they. Having fun. Yeah, you're having fun. It was either the birth of a, a child or a wedding or something like that. So they got the bad intel, so they went in and they busted the doors down, and uh, they just started shooting the place up. And this happens all the time because this is what happens during wartime. And um, uh, I just ordered a book, Andy, as a matter of fact, called uh, Shoot Anything That Moves. Um, we knew this happened during Vietnam because, see, those of us who are old enough to remember this stuff, we remember this stuff. And there's nothing that can take it out of your memory. And, and you know, uh, and we'll report back on that book um, after we're done reading it. But basically, the same thing happens now as happened back then. So, okay, so basically, the whitewash. Yeah, so basically what happens is, when you give a bunch of 18-year-old kids fully automatic weapons, uh, a license to kill, you throw out the Ten Commandments and everything you've ever learned about killing being bad and killing being wrong. And it's not that we don't support the troops. I mean, you, well, it's like the thing with the sinners. I mean, you're supposed to love the sinner but hate the sin. Well, it's the same thing. Of course we support the troops, but we don't support killers because you know, uh, I mean, it's like, uh, hero. I don't know about you, Andy, but heroes to me are people that save lives, yep. not take them. A little bit. So anyways, in, in, the, in the following 20-minute interview, you will hear uh, Jeremy Scahill talking about what we're doing, the drone wars in Mogadishu, where we're killing people right and left, and, you know, and, uh, and, and the drone strikes in Pakistan. But, but more, uh, more to the point, they talk about the people... Um, who are being uh, the, the civilians who are getting bearing the brunt of uh, the military assault in what is for all intents and purposes a civil war okay okay and you know I'm sure it's just a coincidence Andy but every place that we've been to war in the past 40 years has has been a major producer of either hashish or opium or, and, yeah, or, you know, or oil and gas, you know. Or all of the above. Or all of the above, yeah. And, you know, and here's some video uh, shot by our troops, you know. And uh, God bless them, man. You know, who wouldn't want to be stationed over there, I guess. I mean, other than people shooting at you and trying to kill you, it's great duty. Hmm. Yeah. So our motivations are suspect. Well, you know, I do. Far be it from me to assess what the military is up to, but you know, uh, when you when you've trained to do something your entire life, whether it be firefighting or you know, or uh, say like plowing roads, you know, it's like they did plowing the roads. You got to plow it before it melts, you know. Yep. <laughs> when you're trained to do something all your life, and uh, and then they give you, you know, uh, they're going to look for a fight. That's why our founding fathers. Uh, 
in the in the Vermont Constitution, Article 16 says that the people of Vermont have a right to keep and bear arms for the defense of themselves, the state, and uh, you know, and it, well, the state because you know it's a state constitution. But anyways, this is uh, this is early footage from the war, where they would actually go out and destroy uh, poppy crops, which did absolutely nothing for the opium supply no. and just angered the locals. Yep. You know, because I'm sure they'd they'd go from you know making fifty, a hundred grand a year growing poppies to making oh I don't know a thousand growing wheat. Yeah. And it, it, it's I'm sure it's no coincidence that you know that all these uh, rogue banks uh, you know next door in Pakistan are washing all this money. Or it's that just a coincidence. yeah, it's just a coincidence that HSBC. Uh, our hometown bank, uh, four, three weeks ago, got fined a billion dollars for laundering drug money. Yet nobody goes to jail. You know, the only people that go to jail are the junkies who are running around breaking into people's houses and stuff. Somehow, you know, they pressed and pressed for the kingpin law. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, we needed the kingpin law, yep. you know, and people said, well, what about the queen pins? Yep. Oh, you know. I mean, can't leave out the girls, you know. No. <laughs> they know how to make money, too. But anyways, like any prohibition, when you prohibit something, you, you, you may or may not uh, decrease demand. But one thing you will do for certain is you will increase the cost of it. Yep. And so, you know, and, and nobody mentions the Tappy Pipeline either anymore, Andy. No. Look it up sometime. TAPI, the Turkmenistan, Afghani, Pakistan, India pipeline. Because yep. they've got all this oil up here above Afghanistan, and they've got the ports down here near Baluchistan, and they need somebody to guard the place while they install this pipeline. Now, if we pull out, God only knows what's going to happen to the pipeline and Oops, the flow yeah. of oil. I'm sure the Afghans interrupted. Want to, yeah, they want to put their lives on the line to uh, protect our to, oil. To protect our oil, yeah. But anyways, this is a local production. We got permission from Democracy Now to air this video. So for the next 20 minutes, sit down, turn it up, pay attention, and um, you'll hear about the atrocities first here. Because just like Vietnam, you know, you never hear about them when they happen. No. Only after the guys come back. So, enjoy the local production. We're sorry that it's not politically correct. We'll probably, uh, it'll probably get up on PCP nights, either Tuesday or Thursday. And uh, PCP nights? Yeah, PCP, politically charged programming. Oh, okay then. So, so. Have, uh, enjoy a local production from us here at NEK to you, the viewer. Uh, Learn viewers. about the war. Learn about the wars. Learn about the wars. There's no good war. His 16-year-old son became the third U.S. citizen to be killed in a drone strike in Yemen in October 2011. President Obama called the assassination of Anwar al-Awlaki a quote milestone. <laughs> Aden. Yemen's ancient port city was nothing like Kabul. In Afghanistan, life was defined by the war. Everything revolved around it. But in Yemen, there was no war, at least not officially. The strike seemed to have come out of the blue, and most Yemenis were going about life as usual. It was difficult to know where to start. The Yemeni government claimed responsibility for the strikes, saying they'd killed dozens of al-Qaeda operatives. But it was unclear who the targets really were, or who was even responsible. That's Jeremy. Film, um, and you know, I mean, Amy, we, both Rick and I have been on Democracy Now. I mean, I feel like I grew up 
at Democracy Now. I, on, the, on my Facebook page, I list Democracy Now as my university, um, and, and really, really view it that way. Um, and, uh, and 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 you know, because we were talking to you at the time, that we had started on a very different journey, and um, we had read about this uh, this raid that happened in uh, in Gardez in Paktia province uh, because a very very brave reporter named Jerome Starkey, uh, who was a correspondent for the Times of London, who now is in Africa covering the latest sort of expansion of the not so covert war in Mali. And we'll talk um, about we'll that. We'll talk in about a that. Yeah. Um, so we had read about this night raid that took place, and it was a it was a horrible. Uh, massacre and what what happened at, in Gardez was that uh, u s special operations forces had intelligence that there were uh, you know, a Taliban cell was in a um, uh, was having some some sort of a meeting to prepare a suicide bomber and uh, and they raid this house in the middle of the night and they end up killing uh, five people, including three women, two of whom were uh, were pregnant and uh, and another person that they killed in the house uh, Mohammed Daoud. Uh, turned out to be a senior Afghan police commander who had been trained by the U.S., including by the, the mercenary or the private security company, um, MPRI, Military Professional Resources Incorporated. Um, they weren't even Pashtun, the, the dominant, the almost exclusive ethnicity of the Taliban. Uh, they spoke Dari, and, and, and what was happening that night was not preparing a suicide bomber. They were celebrating uh, the, the birth of a child, and they were dancing and had music, and they had women without head covers on, and they uh, and, and and so the soldiers raid this house and they and they kill these people, and and instead of realizing that they had made a horrible mistake, and 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 that and that the, the intelligence was wrong and it resulted in these people being killed, they actually covered up the the killings, and we we interviewed the survivors of this raid including a man who watched while he was zip cuffed his soldiers, American soldiers, digging bullets out of his wife's dead body. Um, and they then tried to... And they did that because? Well, so, so just to finish this part of it, they, they kill the people, they dig the bullets out of the bodies, then they take into custody all of the men of the house, including a man who's just watched his sister and his wife and his niece killed, and they fly them to a different province, and they're interrogating them, trying to get them to give up some information that would indicate that the Taliban had a connection to that family. I mean, it shows you how, how horrid the intelligence is. I mean, these people weren't even Pashtun. You have a senior police commander. They're dancing, playing loud music, and they have women without head cover in the house. Um, and, and, and what happened is that NATO then issues a press release and, and, and made statements anonymously in the media where they said that the U.S. forces had stumbled upon uh, the aftermath of a Taliban honor killing. And they implied that uh, the family, that, that the women were killed by their own murderous families. And, uh, and, and, and so, so in the course of the film, we investigate uh, that night raid. And we learn that the individuals who did that raid were members of the Joint Special Operations Command. And we know that because the then head of the Joint Special Operations Command, uh, Vice Admiral William McRaven, showed up in this village uh, with scores of Afghan soldiers and, and U.S. forces. And they, they, there's a scene, and we show this in the film, where they offload a sheep and they offer to sacrifice the sheep uh, to, to say, you know, ask for forgiveness. It's an it's a Afghan uh, cultural tradition. Uh, and, and it was it was meant to be a gesture of, of reconciliation, and, and they offload the sheep and they're offering to sacrifice it in the very place where the raid had taken place, and then Admiral McRaven goes into the home, and um, and says his men were responsible for for killing the women and the uh, and the police commander, and uh, and he and he asked for forgiveness from the, uh, the head of the family Haji Shirabuddin, had. Uh, had a brave photographer named Jeremy Kelly not been there to snap the photographs that you see in our film of Admiral McRaven in Gardez, we may never have known who the actual killers were that day. And both Jerome Starkey and I have filed Freedom of Information Act requests. We've tried to get information out of the U.S. military. My requests have been bounced all around the military. And the, the most current update I have is months old from them. They said that it's, uh, it's, it's in an unnamed agency uh, awaiting review. Uh, we don't know if anyone was disciplined for the action. We don't know if anyone was ever held accountable for the action. All we know is that Admiral McRaven and a bunch of soldiers showed up with a sheep 
and, and said, we did this and, and, and we're sorry. And tried to destroy Jerome Starkey's reputation, meanwhile, back in Kabul at the yeah, news conference. Jerome Starkey, there's a couple of journalists in our film who really emerge as the heroes uh, of the story that we're telling. Uh, another one is currently in jail in, in Yemen right now, and we can maybe talk about him, named Abdullah Haider Shaya, and we've talked about him on the show before, in jail because President Obama intervened when he was about to be pardoned to keep him in jail after he exposed the role, U.S. role in certain missile strikes. Uh, what so, do you mean he intervened, if you could just say for a well, moment? Well, I mean, uh, there was the, the, the journalist who first exposed the missile strike I was talking about earlier in Al Majla, Yemen, uh, Abdullah Haider Shaya, had taken photographs of the U.S. missile parts, and that's how we, we first learned learned uh, that it was, in fact, uh, U.S. cruise missiles, and Yemen doesn't have cruise missiles. Um, and so uh, after he did his reporting and continued to report um, on, the, on the expanding U.S. air war in Yemen, uh, he was snatched from his home uh, by the U.S.-backed uh, Yemeni counterterrorism units and, uh, and then was put on trial for allegedly being an al-Qaeda facilitator or propagandist and was sentenced to five years in prison. There was huge protest. His, his trial was, was, uh, was uh, denounced as a sham by international human rights and media organizations. And, and, and he was about to be pardoned by the Yemeni president because there was tremendous pressure in the country. And then President Obama called President Ali Abdullah Saleh and expressed his concern over the release of Abdullah, Abdullah Haider Shaya. The and reporter. The, the reporter. And then the pardon was ripped up uh, after that. And his lawyers say clearly that he's in jail because of Obama's intervention, that he, he would have been released. And lest you think this is some kind of a conspiracy theory, you can hop onto the White House website and see the readout of the phone call from that day. The White House put it openly. When I called the State Department uh, to ask them about the case, they said, we stand by President Obama's uh, uh, position on initial position on this uh, regarding this journalist, um, and they don't even refer to him as a journalist. Regarding this individual, he had worked with ABC News, The Washington Post, you know, very small unknown media outlets. Uh, and I heard from from a from a, a, a very a, someone inside of a very prominent news organization in the U.S. told me uh, that they had been called by the uh, administration when they were working with Abdullah Haider Shia, and uh, and told uh, that you should stop working with him because he takes his paychecks and gives them to al-Qaeda. I mean, they, they, they try to slander this journalist behind the scenes and in front. But you, you asked about Jerome Starkey. When Jerome Starkey first exposed the cover-up of Gardez, NATO publicly attacked him by name and accused him of lying. And, and then, and then when, when more information started to come out about who did it, uh, then they changed their story. But they never apologized to Jerome Starkey. And the video footage you retrieve there and the hands of the U.S. soldiers that you see. Yeah, one of the incredible things uh, in Gardez, uh, the family gave us cell phone videos that they had taken the night of the raid. Uh, and there was one clip in particular that was early in the morning. Um, uh, it's a shaky video, and we just thought it was just another sort of shaky video of the bodies. Uh, but then you can hear voices coming over it, and they're American-accented voices speaking about... Uh, piecing together their version of the night's killings, getting their story straight. Um, and, I mean, you, you hear them trying to concoct a story about how this was something other than a massacre. Uh, and you see their hands. And you see, and you see their hands uh, moving the corpses around and photographing the bullet holes. Uh, but we never get to see their faces. All we have are their voices. Uh, we spent a long time actually trying to analyze the audio to figure out, because a name is mentioned in one part of it, um, but it's, uh, it's too thin and distorted on a cell phone to, to find out. I mean, these are, the, these are the, the scraps and pieces that we have to use to, to reconstruct the story of these wars, because, because everything is systematically hidden from us. I mean, all we had to go on were these pictures that Jeremy Kelly took, the cell phone video. Uh, uh, and Jeremy the, Kelly is the photographer, videographer for... Jerome Starkey, For, yes. yeah. uh, who is now the uh, the Kabul Afghan bureau chief. Yeah. Uh, all we had were these were these tiny little scraps of clues that weren't even supposed to exist, um, and, uh, and and pictures of a, of a person who was unknown at the time. I mean, Admiral William McRaven, w you know, no one knew who he was. I mean, that was the first sort of shock. You looked at him, see his rank, read his name, but he's not. He wasn't from the NATO command. He wasn't from the uh, Eastern Regional Command that owns that battle space. He was, um, he was not even, I mean, why was this elite force operating, kicking in the doors on farmers? I mean, that is the sort of the, the, the mystery that begins the investigation. And then you take this forward, Jeremy, back to the United States and show um, uh, McRaven uh, a photograph 
Right, and so we're, you know, after after we we learned that this that that this figure, William McRaven, was uh, the leader of this raid, it, it, it sort of it was it, it, our film was sort of and the this journey was sort of like pulling on an uh, on the tail of an elephant that's behind a hidden wall, and you're you're pulling on you're pulling on it, and the cracks start to show this behemoth that's behind a wall, and you realize that this is part of a much bigger story. And, and really, that that kicked off a journey that took us to to Yemen and Somalia and elsewhere. And you know, for for us, I mean, the sort of in, in, just this incredible looking glass moment happened when Osama bin Laden is killed, and uh, and 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 all of a sudden, everyone is talking about JSOC. It's everywhere. I mean, we had spent so much time embedded in this story where there was very little being written about it, except for a small circle of of journalists. And uh, and all of a sudden, the people that whose journey we'd been tracking had become national heroes. And uh, Disney tried to trademark SEAL Team Six, and uh, you know the the Hollywood producers got in bed with the CIA to 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 make their version of the of the you know the events, the sort of official history. And you're saying uh, that's the film? Well, Zero Dark Thirty. I mean, it's and we can talk about that film later. But I, I mean, the 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 relationship between the CIA. And Hollywood over this issue is one that I think needs to be very, very thoroughly debated. And I'm thankful that we are debating it. And you know, one great thing that that has happened as a result of Zero Dark Thirty is that people are actually talking about torture and 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 what has happened in the past. But for us to see the, the you know McRaven then uh, sitting in front of Congress and JSOC being talked about publicly um, was was really an incredible experience because. We had seen this other side. Our film is about all these things that these same units did that almost never get talked about. The 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 it, what what Americans know about JSOC is overwhelmingly uh, limited to what happened in the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. And you know, Rick often often points out sort of the 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 the, uh, the irony of the way that that's covered versus the role these forces play around the world. Yeah, I mean, we're flooded with with details about one raid the, on, on May 2nd, 2011. We know everything about it. We know how many SEALs were in the helicopters. We know what kind of helicopters they were. We know what kind of rifles they were carrying. We know that they had a dog with them that was a Belgian Malinois named Cairo. We know everything about this raid. Um, but that same year, there were 30,000 other night raids in Afghanistan. Uh, so we know everything about this, but those those are all hidden from us. We're going to break and then come back to a pair of remarkable investigative journalists whose investigations are now a film, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield, that has just premiered here at the Sundance Film Festival in its 10th year. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a Somali Canadian Canaan singing Somalia, his home country. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, and we're with two great journalists, um, Rick Rowley and Jeremy Scahill. Jeremy, a longtime Democracy Now! correspondent and national security correspondent for the nation. Rick Rowley, videographer, filmmaker who has been in Iraq and Afghanistan for many years. They've now put together this film, Dirty Wars. Um, the world is a battlefield. And it has premiered here. In fact, Kanan was here celebrating the first night. Um, and I want to talk about Somalia and Mali. But let's start with a clip of this film in Somalia. Jeremy, can you introduce it? Yeah, we, what we discovered in Somalia was that the, the U.S. had been for years um, outsourcing its kill list in Somalia to local warlords. And uh, in our film, you meet two of those warlords, Mohamed Kanyare and Inda Ade. And Inda Ade, at one time, was protecting people who, who were on the U.S. kill list. And he was an ally of the al-Qaeda and al-Shabaab figures within Somalia. And he's been flipped and is now working with the U.S. So here we meet Inda Ade, this notorious warlord who's working on the side of the U.S. In an earlier life, Inda Ade had been America's enemy, offering protection to people on the U.S. kill list. But the warlord had since changed sides. He was now on the U.S. payroll and assumed the title of general. 
So he's saying that the fiercest fighting that they're doing right now is happening right here. The men fired across the rooftops, but it didn't make sense to me what we were doing here or what the Americans were doing here in Somalia, arming this warlord turned general for what seemed like a senseless war. We gotta move. So these were Shabab fighters you buried here? If we capture fighters alive, we give them medical care. Unless they are foreigners. The foreigners, we execute. If you capture a foreigner alive, you execute them on the battlefield? Uh, yes, the others should feel no mercy. The U.S.-backed Somali warlord Inda Adi, uh, journalist Jeremy Scahill there in Somalia, Rick Rowley filming. Uh, Jeremy, talk about Somalia and Mali as we, the world learns about Mali now with the French uh, attacks on Mali and what's happened in Algeria and how that ties into the central theme of your film about JSOC. Right. I think mean, one thing that's interesting, you know, we, we have some people from within the JSOC community whose identities we protect in the film, uh, and, and we're talking to them. And, and, and we, we actually, at, you know, two years ago were considering going to Mali because we were hearing from our sources um, that there were, there were covert operations that were happening inside of Mali, um, tracking these, the spread of these, uh, these Al-Qaeda affiliates. And, you know, the, 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 this is, is, is something that we're seeing throughout the Horn of Africa and in places throughout the Sahel and North Africa um, where these groups are getting stronger and stronger. Um, and, and so the, you know, the U.S. is increasingly getting itself involved in these dirty wars in Africa. And you know, we could have easily gone to Uganda or Somalia um, or Mali and, and, and reported on this, but, but there's, you know, since AFRICOM was created as a full freestanding command, uh, like Southern Command um, and uh, Central Command, AFRICOM has, has been expanding these wars. Um, and McRaven, where he is now? M McRaven is the, is the commander of the Special Operations Command. He is, he, William McRaven is, is the most powerful figure in the United States military. He is an, he's an incredibly brilliant man. He's very shrewd. He understands media, um, and he is in charge of the most elite force the U.S. has ever produced. And he has been given carte blanche to do what he believes is right around the world, empowered much more under President Obama than they were under President Bush. In fact, you see someone who's worked within JSOC saying that to us in our film. And, and out of Camp Lemonnier, uh, which is in Djibouti, the U.S. Has, is, has been expanding these covert wars in Africa, and Somalia, most of what most Americans what they what, what they know about Somalia is Black Hawk Down, and I think in our film you're going to see a very different reality, and you're going to see a hellscape that has been built by a decade of covert war. Is it too cynical to say? I mean, this is the fourth anniversary of President Obama promising to close Guantanamo. It hasn't happened. There's still um, uh, scores of men there, 166 men. It's something more than 80 of them have been cleared, yet they're still there. Is it too cynical to say that this dirty war, as you call it, um, the targeted killings, are a way to end all of these prisons? Because you don't detain the prisoners. You simply kill them. Well, that's what people like Jack Goldsmith and, and other, you know, former Bush legal advisors and national security team. I mean, the irony of, of these guys who, who have no moral standing to, 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 to talk about these issues um, are saying, well, Obama's just killing these people. At least we stuck them in some sort of a prison. I mean, it's, it's, it's devastating that this is what these Bush people are saying about Obama. That's, that's what they're alleging. Well, devastating is your film, uh, Dirty Wars. The world is a battlefield. It is premiered here at the Sundance Film Festival. It's just been picked up by IFC Sundance Selects, which means it'll go out to scores of movie theaters around the country. Um, this is just the beginning, and I congratulate you both, Jeremy Scahill, Rick Rowley of Big Noise Films and The Nation Magazine and Democracy Now! What an amazing film. Uh, this is our first day at the Sundance Film Festival. I thank all for uh, all the work they've done. Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Aaron Mate, Nermin Shake, Steve Martinez, Sam Alcohani, Masood, Ravi Karan, Dennis Moynihan, Brenda Mirad. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us. 
and there's no good army except for the Salvation Army. Yep. So, see you next time.